Yeah, it's not, vacation Bible school is not coming. It's here, right? And um, you would not believe the amounts of conversations that I've had over the last few days about, hey, where are you going to preach from? And um, how are you going to get in there? And so this morning we threw around the idea of me coming down the waterfall to some entrance music. We couldn't get that worked out. And then Melissa said, well, you can preach from the river. And I was like, no, I'm not standing on water and people think I think I'm Jesus. So I can't walk. So I'm going to have to do it down here. So uh, a couple words of thanks before we begin anything to our awesome volunteers and decorating and our teachers, uh, the folks that are going to be serving. Would you just give them a, a thank you this morning for all that again? I know, I know you've done that once already, but there was an incredible amount of work that went into prepping this week for these kids and adults uh, to be excited about coming to a place where they can hear about Christ. And we are super, super thrilled about that today. I, I'm excited because I get to do something new this year, and, and it's just going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome time. Um, and as I'm preaching on the floor, I apologize to the front row uh, because they're going to be right here the whole time. I do want to thank Brent for not sitting in his usual seat, uh, or it had just been me and him talking one-on-one this morning. So we got to be flexible, right? We got to be just whatever needs to happen is going to have to happen, okay? Uh, but today, again, Vacation Bible School, man, and if you haven't figured out the theme yet, I'm going to tell you, the theme this year is The Great Jungle Journey, and in fact, it has a tagline. It says, an epic cruise from Genesis all the way to Revelation, and you know that's a huge task at any point in time to come and share this great, great story from creation to cross to Jesus Christ's return again. And so I want you as a church family to be praying for all those folks that are volunteering. I want you to be praying for all the students and the children uh, that will be here uh, throughout this week who will hear the gospel in a very clear and a very powerful way. I want you to pray that lives will be changed, not just those kids who signed up, but maybe you adults that are serving and volunteering that you may see something new about your faith this uh, week as we do this, but it's going to be an amazing, amazing time. And so I want to have just a real time, uh, time of prayer here this morning uh, before we get into our message, just praying over Vacation Bible School. Um, I want you, God, to impress something on your heart to pray specifically for right now, and I know that he will. And so I just want you to join me in prayer uh, as we begin today. Father, we are so incredibly thankful uh, for the opportunity today uh, to be here in worship with one another and to be uh, with you and your presence with us. Uh, God, we look and we see the decorations around. We see the hours of hard work and, and sacrifice that our volunteers have given uh, to prepare this place to be a place that would welcome in students and adults this week um, to hear not just about how cool we can decorate, but what an amazing God that you are. And I pray today, Father, that I know people are already beginning to be tired because they've worked tirelessly to prepare things. And God, we need your strength for this week uh, because God, we're going to be talking with children and, and students and adults uh, who are bringing life into this place. And our prayer is that what they bring into here can be changed and transformed so that they can not just take life away, but new life in Christ. And so Father, today I pray uh, that you will give those who are serving and volunteering strength and energy and clarity, uh, use their words for the God and the gospel to change people's hearts and lives and maybe, God, this week it would be our lives that are changed because of the ministry that's going to take place here. Um, God, all we know to do is entrust this entire week to you and into your hands. And we do that now. Uh, so, Father, use us for your glory. Uh, we pray these things and ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. It's going to be a great week, you all. I just kind of want to walk you through Vacation Bible School Sunday. Uh, it's kind of a special Sunday as we kind of walk through from the pulpit part. Uh, what the kids are going to be looking at and try to give you some encouragement to take home this week as you pray and as you serve, as you go and as you come back here uh, this evening. Again, the great jungle journey. I want to share one verse of scripture with you today uh, that's going to talk about uh, really the fullness of this week. It's Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine. It's going to be on the screens for you this morning if you don't have your Bible. The word of God says this, know that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God who keeps his gracious covenant loyalty for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commands. The very first line, know that the Lord your God is God. When we get this instruction in Deuteronomy, it kind of sums up all that we're going to walk through this week. And this morning, I just want to show you a little bit about what the students are going to go through. 
As you look at our stained glass windows around, you're going to see seven banners all around this room. And these kids and students will be going through the seven C words on these banners this week. And it is literally, as I said earlier, a journey from Genesis all the way to Revelation. To my right and to your left, the first banner up here by our normally tiki cut covered drum set this morning is creation. It begins with creation. It begins that God is good and his creation is good. And now as we share with these students and folks this week, they need to understand that in the heart and the mind of God, before any of us took a breath, we were part of his creation. And that no matter the, the, the faults that we would have, the things that we don't see in ourselves, we are his creation and therefore we are good. Now our sinfulness keeps us distracted and distanced from God in that relationship, but in his mind and all that he created in the very first beginning was good. And we need to understand his love and his grace and his mercy towards us in that act of creation. But then switching sides over the next night and two nights, they're going to talk about three big words. Number one is corruption. We're going to talk about sin. We're going to talk about what happened, that what was good is now corrupted by the sinful nature and the flesh and how pursuing our wants over God's design will get us to a place in our faith and our journey with God that none of us want to go and that none of us can recover from save the fact of Jesus Christ. And so from that corruption and that sinfulness, we go back over to here, the catastrophe. What happens when all that was good is now no longer good? What is God doing and how is God going to bring us back? How is he going to redeem us? How is he going to reconcile us? And I know this is a story of the gospel. All of this is. And you say, well, I know the gospel. We'll re-know it and relearn it this week. Let God work through you. And from that catastrophe of what was good is now not good because of this sin in our life, we come back to confusion. And we talk about the Tower of Babel and what happened in that story. And in that moment, what did God do in the confusion in the midst of chaos, how did God work and how did he move? And we'll move from there to this next window back here, which is Christ and then over here, the cross. That the only way of redemption, the only way to restore relationship with God is through a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. The only way. Nothing good that we can do, nothing good within us, nothing of ourselves, but by the very grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, can we see a relationship with God restored? And then finally, on the very back window, the consummation, the conclusion, the second coming of Jesus Christ, Revelation, Genesis, back and forth, all the way to Revelation. What's going to be made new and how are we going to be made new? What's God doing in that moment? It's going to be a powerful week for these students. It should be a powerful week for you as you are here praying and going over things. So I want you to pray for these students over this journey because every single one of you in this room are somewhere on that journey. You will find yourself on a banner somewhere. My hope and prayer is that you understand that Jesus Christ loves you and he died for you. He died for your sin. And then his death and his burial and his resurrection on the cross is the only thing that makes eternal life for you or for anyone who comes to Jesus Christ. So maybe you're here today and you don't have that relationship with Christ set. Maybe you look up there and you're saying, well, I see how it goes, but I find myself stuck here or here. Or maybe I'm struggling here. So maybe today you need to allow the Lord to just work in your life in a very simple way. You just need to respond to the gospel. And maybe you're a believer. Doesn't mean you can't respond to the gospel. Why is that? Because the good news of Christ keeps us living and breathing and moving and walk with him. And so today and through the rest of this week, these students and these adults and a lot of them are going to be talking about these very things. Seven C's. Easy way for you to remember how to present the gospel to somebody. You can take these words and you can share what Jesus Christ did in your life while these kids are learning about it in theirs. And my hope and my prayer is that we're going to see people to this week come to know Jesus Christ. So that's just a little bit of what they're going to be going through this week. What you can be praying over this week. So this morning, what I want to do then is just to give you some encouragement, give you some encouragement. Sometimes we need to be reminded of something, don't we? How many of you all have lived a place in time in your life uh, when you've forgotten something about yourself and someone spoke words into your life to remind you just who you are and just build you up and encourage you in that moment? 
Maybe you're struggling with something in your life. Maybe it's a, a certain sin or you just feel down or you just don't, uh, you've lost some faith in who you are and what God has called you to do and you're struggling and you're just discontent. You may even be depressed. You may be anxious about it. You may be a lot of things. And then someone come into your life in that moment and just speak one sentence into your life. And all of a sudden, God used those words to remind you of who you are in Christ. And then from that moment, you became encouraged. And because you were reminded of who God is in your life, and because you were encouraged by the words that people spoke into your life, or, a, or just a look, a smile, a card, a t- it doesn't matter what it was. But when they spoke that moment into your life, you were renewed and refreshed in your walk with Christ. Everybody in this room has struggled at some point in time. Everybody in this room has felt the, the impact and the benefit of God's people praying over their lives. You may have been the one to make those phone calls and say those words. You may be the one who wrote that note. You may be the one who stopped somebody out here in one of the hallways and said, God has just impressed on my heart to pray for you and to speak words into your life because I just know he has something better for you. I want to remind you of five things this week that center around this very Vacation Bible School theme and that hopefully will speak some encouragement into your life as well. I know not everybody can be here for VBS and I understand that, but yeah, but look, we've got age groups for everybody. And I know it's in the evening and I know it gets crazy, but if you really want to be poured into this week, come sit through our adult class adults, bring your kids, let people pour into them over these next four or five days and remind them of some of these things. When we start with creation this week, the first truth I want you to remember is this, that God is the good creator. He is the good creator. Why do we have to insert good in there? Well, because there's a lot of bad things happening around us. There's a lot of things that we question as to why is even part of what we're doing. But in Genesis chapter one, verse 31, you know, the creation story. If you don't, that's good. Cause you're going to hear a lot about it this week. This is what it, the word of God says. Genesis 1 31. God saw that all that he had made and it was very good Indeed. Now, how, are you, how do you and I use the word good? Not like it's used here. We use good, in other words, for lots of different things. I may ask you today, hey, have you tried out so-and-so's restaurant? You can say, oh, yeah, it was, it was good. But the way you say good tells me I'm not sure if I want to try that or not. Or I may say, hey, have y'all been down to Jeremiah's and got the gelato? And you're like, oh, yes, good. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, I'm there. Right? You know, well, how was church today? It was good. Awesome. How's the pastor? Yeah, it was good. I, 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 I get it. I've been on both sides of that coin, right? Good for us is just like, now nah, we just determine if it's good because it meets our need. Or if we like what was there to offer. Or good to us is selfish, right? That's how we determine if something is meaningful and good into our lives. But when God spoke this into being, and when God said something was good, That meant that it was pure and it was whole and it was righteous and it was without fault and there was no blemish and there was no sin. And it was as perfectly designed as he designed it in his mind and his heart before we would ever know about it. His use of good does not fall to the trivial things of life. It talks about the goodness and the fullness of life itself. That when God opened his mouth and said, let there be, it was. And it wasn't like we think it was, but it was good, not according to our ways, but according to God's ways. And so God is not just creator. He is the good creator. And maybe in your life right now, you need to be reminded that God is still the source of all the goodness in your life. What did we just, we sang, I guess, a couple weeks ago, the goodness of God. I love watching our congregation and our choir sing that song. Because immediately you can't help but enter into a worshipful attitude when you're thinking about the goodness of God in your life. When you start singing those words like, all my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been so, so what? Good. It's easy for us in this world today to be tempted to think that we are the author of our lives. But the word of God says that Jesus Christ is the author and the and the finisher of our faith. 
And so we need to sometimes just take a step back and say, like we've done in the past, let me sit and just count the blessings of my life. But you know, it's easy when we read about the creation story to just look at all that God made. And God said of those things he made, as I just read in Genesis 1, that they were all very good. But sometimes even talking about that verse, we forget it's not just what he created was good, but that he himself is good. If I were to ask you this morning to just raise your hand and say, hey, who would share this morning about how good God has been in your life? People would be already putting their hands up, right? Why is that? Because we recognize him as the source of all things. And not only in creation, as God is good creator, did he make everything. But when God created as the creator, he gave everything purpose and meaning. All that was created was given purpose and meaning. Even when he created, when he said, let there be light, there was purpose and meaning in light and darkness. When the waters came, there was purpose in that. Why? Because in those waters, there would be living beings. And when that ground was raised and the vegetation came, why was that? Because there would be people who would take care of that. Every single minute detail, all of God's creation has a purpose and has a value and has a meaning. And so maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're sitting here saying, you know what? Thankful to God created everything and I'm a part of God's creation. In fact, I am his crowning creation. You can call yourself the very apple of the eye of the God of all creation, but yet you still may be struggling to find purpose and meaning in your life. Can I encourage you today? Stop looking for your purpose and your meaning in your circumstances and come back and find it in your creator. What you do is not who you are in Christ. It may be an overflow of the things he's doing in your life, but to find your true meaning, your true purpose, your true calling, all of what God created for you to be in that moment as part of his good and perfect creation, find that in your lives. Creation, the Bible teaches us, it's a mirror. God's creation reflects his nature and his character. And in the word of God, in the creation story, God speaks to the spirit and to the son and says, let us make man how in our image. You, whether you want to believe it or accept it or not, are a reflection of the heart of God the father. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who your creator is. Creation in all of it. It's God's demonstration. His love, his power, his wisdom, over your life. So be encouraged today. God is the good creator and you are his good creation. Find that again in your life. A second thing though, that we talk about as creation, we see that there is corruption and catastrophe and confusion this week. And maybe that's where you find your life right now. But also I want to encourage you in this, and this may not sound really encouraging at the beginning, but let me tell you, God is also our righteous judge. And nobody wants to talk about judgment. Right? Nobody wants to say, oh, great. Thank you, Pastor. You just told me I'm his creation. Now you're telling me he's judging me for it. And he will judge. But understand that God is not a judge as we judge. But the purposeful, intentional wording is that he is a righteous judge. And I want you to know today that instead of fearing that, we should be thankful for it. We should be thankful. That the God who loves us and created us will judge us in his righteousness and not ours. Psalm 50 verses 1 through 6 say these words. The mighty one, God, the Lord speaks. He summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. Our God is coming and he will not be silent. Devouring fire precedes him and a storm rages around him and on high he summons the heavens and the earth in order to judge his people. Gather my faithful ones to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness for God is the judge. And you say, wow, thanks for that uplifting passage. I don't know if we make that anyone's life verse this morning or not, but understand as fearful as that seems, it's also our salvation because of who he is. He's righteous. 
That as he looks upon our fault and our failure, for those of us who are in relationship with Jesus Christ, he does not see our sin. He sees our Savior. And he only does that because he's just and he's holy and his righteousness. Judgment and salvation are two sides of the same coin. And what you've done with Christ ultimately decides which that is. So as judge, one of the great things about that is that God is impartial. He's not like you and I. He doesn't judge things based on our preferences or based on what gets us the best results or what we like and what we do not like. We are all his creation. And when he judges, he judges impartially. He does not look at you and say, hmm, You did what you did, and I really don't like you, so I'm going to give you this punishment. But you over here, I love you. You're my boy. You're my daughter. You're my child. And and I know I created you this way, and I'm just going to, you know what, I'm just going to say bye for that. No. When God judges, he looks at our sin, and he looks at it equally, and he is impartial. He doesn't judge us based on his preference, but he judges us in Christ, in Christ alone. He judges sin. Not the sinner. And so when we look at our lives and in relationship with Christ, to know that if we have a relationship with Jesus, our judgment is his promise. That salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. Our sin is forgiven. And on that day when Christ returns, we will be with Christ forever. And if we have no relationship with Jesus Christ, we will be separated from God forever. Those are the only criteria. And because he is impartial and because he is righteous and holy and just and unchanging, it is for our benefit and for our good that he is. As judge, God knows and examines our heart. He also judges the action or the inaction in our life. There's a lot of prayers, to be honest with you, would you say that you've been maybe afraid to pray in your life? I said one time when we did a parent-child dedication at a former church, and parents stood up, and um, years and years ago, he actually, they didn't have a child to dedicate. They'd done it years before. He came up to me after the service, and he said, you know, he said, about 18 years ago, I stood up on that stage, and I dedicated my daughter, and I said, all right, God, you do whatever you want to do in her life, and now she's leaving for Africa for two years. And he said, the hardest prayer I ever prayed was to say, all right, God, I told you I'd do this, but now I'm going to follow through to let her go, right? And he said, but I knew in my heart that God had prepared her for this, and he was more than able to protect her while she was gone. He said, had I not followed through, I would have been judged for my inaction and belief and faith in Christ and what God was doing. He said, that was the hardest prayer I probably ever prayed and had God answer, and then me have to follow through. Some of us would find it very difficult this morning here in this room to pray the psalm that says, search me, God, and know my heart. Look deep within and find if there's any way in my heart and my life and my living that is out of your will. And lead me to restoration and relationship with you. That's a hard prayer to pray. Why is it? Is it because God is harsh? No, but because we have to own it in our own lives. But here's the thing. As judge, God demonstrates to us his unchanging righteousness and his commitment to his word. His truth and his heart and his character that God does what he says he will do every time. That if he promises you redemption in relationship with Christ, He will fulfill that. He never starts something he does not finish. So as he looks into our lives and judges the heart of our desires and our intentions and our walk with him, he does so as holy and righteous and true. Not what we put up with in this daily world. When we see confusion and corruption and we see catastrophe, God has judged sin. And through Jesus Christ and the relationship with him, sin has no power, no sting, no dominion in our lives. And so God is forever, forever our righteous judge. And we should be thankful for that. For We can't do it on our own. Third is this, that God is also the infinite sustainer. The infinite sustainer. 
Psalm 54 verse 4 says this, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my life. A truth you may need to be reminded of this morning is that God continuously upholds and cares for his creation. And you are a part of that. That whatever you're walking through right now, your source of strength, your source of sustenance, your source of reliance on everything is in the sustaining power of God at work in your life. But I ask you this morning for you to think of someone that you know in your life or connected to. And I will give you these parameters and I would say to you, hey, look, I want you to think about someone who you in your life do not understand how they can put one foot in front of the other. I want you to think about someone who gets up every day and walks a journey that we have been protected from. That walks a road that is so hard and so difficult, but yet every day they get up and they walk that road in the strength and the power of God and God alone. Talk to that person about God as sustainer. Talk to that person when everything else is falling apart, when everything else fails, when everything else just doesn't meet expectations. Who is it and what is it that gets them to that next step ahead? It's going to be God and his sustaining power through their life. And here's the thing. Don't envy it. Embrace it. Some of us would say, you know, I wish my faith were there. And I wish that every day I got up, not that I had to walk that road, but that I had to be able to, I could surrender to the one who sustains my life every day. Well, it wouldn't take any of us long, would it, this morning, to take two minutes and realize that God's sustaining power is evident in every one of our lives for his provision and his protection over each and every one of us. That God is still doing a work in your life. The breath that you breathe right now is his. It's a gift of his. That you are here is because of him. The fact that we are still able to worship together in this place, to feed our families, to do the things that our world requires for survival, that God is the sustainer of all things. But you have to let him be. Many of us today are walking around and we're spiritually burnt. We're tired and we're exhausted trying to do these things to keep our relationship with God intact when really what we need to do is just lean in to the helper and the sustainer of our lives. I mean, that's where you are right now. Maybe you're trying to battle some supernatural things and natural ability. You can't do it. You will lose every time. If one of the most encouraging things I can tell you today is that in your own strength, fighting battles of spiritual nature, you'll fail every time, then let that be encouraging to you. I will gladly be a loser to be someone who surrenders to the sustaining power of God in our lives. Now, the beautiful fact that God is the sustainer of life is that it means that he is intimately involved in every detail of your life every day, every day. I think sometimes we tend to see God as so distant, don't we? We tend to see him as just up there. And, and, and it's true. I mean, we read Ecclesiastes. We're going to be careful when we come into his presence, reverent, Right? Because God is here and we're here, so we should let our words be few. But, but understand that God is here and with us in every aspect and detail of our life. He sees every prayer that you hear, every prayer that you pray. He sees every situation before it touches you. He sees the way out of every situation before it touches you. He is intimately involved in every part of our lives. Whether we acknowledge him or not, him or not he is there. Maybe today you just need to remember that. That your life is not insignificant. Your trial is not insignificant. It may not be mind-blowing to the person sitting next to you. It might not even be comparable to the person two rows behind you. But it is what you are going through. And what you are going through is still under the hand of the God who sustains you. So maybe today you need to remember that he is sustainer. It's what allows us to get through the confusion. Allows us to fight our sin allows us to see the consequence of our actions because he walks with us all the way. We move to Christ and the cross. We see then, number four, that God is the sovereign savior. He is our sovereign 
Savior. When Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he writes these words. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, but to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. That God is our sovereign Savior. That God in his sovereignty works all things for his good. Now, he doesn't say that all things are good in Romans, right? We read that passage in Romans 8. It says, for all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we miss it so much because we say, well, that just means if it works for his good, it must be good. That's not the case. It just says that all things work together. What are all things? Well, all things are good things and all things are bad things. All things are easy things and all things are hard things. But it is not the things which matter, but the sovereignty of God over them. I think this morning, sometimes we just need to be reminded that we just need to understand that God has complete authority and control over all things. There is absolutely nothing I can do to change his mind. And there's absolutely nothing I can do, as I've shared with you before, that surprises him. I can't serve enough. I can't build a set well enough. I can't do anything. I can't give enough for God to sit up in heaven and be like, wow, didn't know you could do that. Of course he knows we can do that. Why? Because we're all his creation. He knows exactly what you're able to do because he's the one who enables you to do it. And so sometimes we just need to step back and be like, you know what, God, all this stuff that's out of my control is in your hand. And I can either join it or fight it. So join it. In his sovereignty, though, it's, what, it's why God can offer redemption to us. It's why we can have Jesus. It's why we have the cross. It's why we have the empty grave. That he gives us redemption and new life and eternal life to those who accept the gift of Jesus Christ and salvation. He alone is over that. You know, the crazy part is that he didn't have to. He didn't have to. We can have relationship with Christ because of one thing grace. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. And God didn't have to give it. But it's by grace we are saved through faith. It is a gift, not of ourselves, so that no one can boast about it. So in his sovereignty is over eternity. And therefore through Christ, he demonstrates a willingness to redeem us to reconcile our relationship, to renew our life all through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And only God did that for you. No one else will, has, or ever will do what God has done for you. The thing I love about sovereignty and redemption um, is a verse from the prophet Jonah, believe it or not. Jonah chapter three, verse one says this. Man, that's a simple sentence, but man, I want you to think about it. Jonah 3, 1 said this, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. Did Jonah do what God called him to do the first time? Nope. Do you? No, I don't. Tell me that there's grace when God will say, you know what? I'm going to go back a second time. Why? Because this is my will. And I want you to be a part of it. Are we living in the sovereignty of God today? Finally, this morning, when we talk about the consummation, the conclusion of the kingdom, we talk about God as loving redeemer. As loving redeemer. Isaiah chapter 43, verses one through three, a, the first part say this. Now, this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, O Jacob, the one who formed you, O Israel, do not fear. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. And the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. And the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, 
the Holy One of Israel, I am your Savior. He is our Savior. Redemption then is possible because God's unconditional love that he has for creation. How many of y'all this morning realize that we do not fully embrace what unconditional love is really all about? Unconditional love is exactly what it says. That no matter the circumstance, love is present. God loves you not because of your circumstance, but through your circumstance. Why does he love you? Because you are his creation. Because he is love. And as redeemer, God's love has been demonstrated over our lives time after time. He shows us compassion. How many of y'all would say today, you're thankful for the compassion of God over your life? How many of you today would be thankful for his grace that even makes life with him possible? How many of you all today would be thankful that he's a God who forgives when we fail? That he is a God who restores and renews your life. That which redeems you and calls you to his purpose. Maybe today we just need to be reminded of how much God loves you and all that he's done for each and every one of us in this room. That wherever you find yourself in and whatever picture that God may be showing to you in your life right now is exactly who he is to you in this moment. Maybe you need him to be redeemer. Maybe you need him to be sovereign over your life. Maybe we just need him to be all things because that is exactly what he is. So this week, as we go through vacation Bible school, don't just let the kids be the one getting the blessing. Remember this week who God is, what he's doing in your life and what he's done and what he wants to continue to do. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but maybe you're here and that's just where you find yourself today. You find yourself caught in the middle somewhere between these banners, somewhere between broken heart, somewhere between desperation. There's a God who loves you more than you'll ever know. And he is everything that you need. So if there are things you need to give to him today, I challenge you to do that now. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for the gift of this day. I thank you for what's getting ready to take place here the rest of this week. But I don't want to go there yet, Father, because I want to make sure we're focused on what you're doing right now. Now, that Father, today, maybe there are just some things we need to remember that you're over in our life. Maybe there are some things we need to give back to you that we've maybe taken away from you. But to be reminded, God, through what these kids and adults will learn this week, that from Genesis to Revelation and beyond, you are God and you love us. The imperfections that we see, God, are only things that we see, for we are created in your image. And let us give them to you today. Maybe today, Father, we just start to trust you even more. With those parts of our lives which we have no control over. And we're going to rest in your sovereignty. We're going to heal in your spirit. Whatever it is today, God, we're here to pray together. I pray you just lift us to a place that we may be with you in this moment. No one else. That our hearts and our minds are just given to you right now.